remote Bikini Atoll in the Central Pacific, preparations are speeded for America's test of the atom bomb against ships of war. Steel towers will support cameras to record the explosions. For months from San Francisco and other ports, the vast armada of obsolete target ships has been heading for its rendezvous with the fourth atomic bomb. Among them are the Japanese cruiser Sakawa, the Japanese battleship Nagato, and the German heavy cruiser Prince Eugen. These are the ships that will bear the shock of the test bomb. Upon the results of these tests, the navies of the future will be based. To record the blast pressures, towers for special instruments are made ready. Target ships are loaded with materiel, bulldozers, jeeps, planes are lashed to the decks, themselves targets on the target ships. On the deck of the famous Shangri-La, flagship for the experiment, pilotless planes rehearse their part in the operation. Guided by radio, four of them will fly through the billowing masses of smoke following the atomic blast. Each will carry airtight bags that will scoop up samples of the smoke. The bomb will be dropped from a B-29 superfortress, piloted perhaps by Colonel Paul Tibbets, who piloted the plane that bombed Hiroshima. Within Bikini's 21-mile lagoon, the future of America's Navy will be determined. Hundreds of expert eyes will focus on these floating targets as destructive force, the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT, determines whether existing naval vessels are obsolete. Over the exact center of the Navy's most powerful warship types, the bomb will be exploded. The old battleship Nevada will serve as the aiming point. Around it will be arrayed more than a score of ships, concentrated within a circle of 1,000 yards radius. Destroyers, submarines, landing craft, every type of ship. This is a test which the Navy needs to answer many vital questions for the future. Out of the fire and smoke of the weapon that changed the thoughts of the entire world will come the United States Navy of the future. possibility of a serious infantile paralysis epidemic, health authorities of the city of San Antonio, Texas attacked the germ carriers throughout the city. With the war discovered DDT in special sprayers, sections of the city are blanketed with the insecticide in the fight to stop the spread of the dread poliomyelitis. Every suspected spot is sprayed. Even the streams are disinfected, and in the parks and public places, children are forbidden to gather. Tons of DDT are used in this fight against the dread disease, whose principal target is the young. Again, war has contributed one of its discoveries to save life. At the White House in Washington, war veterans from hospitals in this capital area are entertained at a lawn party given by the President and Mrs. Truman. The veterans, all 1,200 of them, were wounded in the war. Secretary of State Burns and other government dignitaries joined the Trumans in the receiving line. The men in the party represent all branches of the armed forces from all the theaters of war. Light refreshments are served as for an hour and a half, the president fulfills the duties as host to heroes of the nation before returning to the complex problems of government. Four of a kind, 
quadruplets are born in Memorial Hospital in the state of North Carolina in southeastern United States. Mrs. Annie Mae Fultz, mother of the quadruplets, gets a congratulatory kiss from Father James Fultz, a local farmer. And here is Dr. Fred Klenner, who saw the four little girls into the world. All of them weighed just a little under four pounds each, and they're all doing nicely. There are six children in the family already, and this sudden quadruple addition will keep everybody busy at home. Joe Lewis, world heavyweight boxing champion, puts the finishing touches to his training for the championship bout with Billy Kahn. The champion keeps his sparring partners busy with the fight only a few days off. Lewis knows he will have a fight on his hand. Jacobs, the fight promoter, watches carefully as challenger Billy Kahn gets into fighting trim. The last time the two met, Kahn fought the champion to a standstill for 13 rounds, only to lose by a knockout. Both the fighters are supremely confident as boxing resumes its big-time bouts. On the slopes of the Rocky Mountains in America's far west, thousands of sheep graze contentedly, a heavy crop of wool on the hoof. The roundup begins and the sheep head for the shearing stations and the market. Everybody in this Colorado town comes out for the season's leading social event. They come from the farms of the area to watch the sheep shearing contest. And Cora Myers wins the competition. He sheared five sheep in 12 and a half minutes. General Dwight D. Eisenhower is greeted in Nanking, China by his former chief, General George Marshall, now United States Ambassador to China. The general's first call is at the home of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. He arrives in China just a year after the German surrender in Europe. <music> Leaving the Chinese capital, Eisenhower continues his tour of army inspection. At Atsugi Airfield, General MacArthur welcomes him to Japan. During the war, the two supreme commanders led millions of men to victory. Now they meet to discuss the problems of the peace. By special train, Eisenhower leaves for a tour of the Japanese island with the Occupation Army's commander, General Eichelberger. At Kobe, Chief of Staff Eisenhower talks with the soldiers of the occupying forces. Back in Tokyo, on the reviewing stand with the representatives of the Allied Nations, Eisenhower reviews American troops on parade. One year ago, as Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe, Eisenhower led his armies to complete victory. Now, as Chief of Staff of the United States Army, he looks to the welfare of his men at home and abroad. Yeah. 